Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, on this week's show, I'm doing a follow-on from last week's episode where I gave you top tips to measure your health. It is so important to measure lots of different aspects of our health. And this week, I'm looking at what the best tests and screenings you should be getting that will tell you where your health is at. From blood pressure to skin checks, we have it all on this week's episode. Joining me to take us through his top health checks that could save your life is Professor Carl Vaughan. Consultant cardiologist at CUH Mercy Hospital and Bond Secures in Cork. Professor Vaughan, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for taking the time out to talk to us. I know hospitals are jammed at the moment with uh, with COVID and non-COVID, so we really appreciate having you on the show. Let's get stuck into it straight away. Health screenings are really important for people. Why should they be getting health screenings at all? Well, I think uh, the reason that people should get health screenings is to ensure that they stay well. Um, it's not necessarily a search for diseases, it's a search for wellness as well as diseases where, so that you can identify uh, something that may be incubating in your body for the future um, and head it off before it becomes you know, an advanced disease or does damage that can't be subsequently fixed in future years. For example, treating high blood pressure, blood pressure has no symptoms. In general, uh, you can't you can't guess what it is. You have to measure it, and it's a re- it can be done in in five minutes. So that that's just an example of a simple health check that can be done by anyone themselves, or in their doctor's surgery, or in a pharmacy or in a clinic. And do you think that people are kind of uh, nervous or reluctant or apprehensive, maybe of 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 being of taking that aspect to health, which is very much a proactive aspect of let's get it checked before it becomes a problem, as opposed to being reactive when it is a problem? Are people kind of afraid of that? I think so. I think symptoms are 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 very important, and and symptoms are a great driver. I mean, if I had a toothache now, I'd go straight to the dentist, but I may put off dental cleaning because oh, I'm fine. I'm brushing my teeth. I think. A lot of the things we screen for are things that won't present with symptoms until late. Uh, someone that has a terribly high cholesterol may glide by for decades, then have a heart attack. Someone with high blood pressure may develop a stroke. They never knew they had high blood pressure. Um, and we see this all the time at the hospital level where we know that something has been incubating for a long time and it hasn't come to medical attention because someone says, I don't have a GP or I haven't seen a GP in years. I felt fine. Why would I, why would I bother? So I think there's a disconnect uh, with the asymptomatic conditions that you mentioned in your introduction and symptomatic disease is, is more straightforward someone comes in with a pain or shortness of breath or you know palpitations or weight loss or lack of appetite or bleeding and they come to medical attention very quickly but that's often advanced disease that presents with symptoms so the whole purpose of screening is to identify disease early so it can be switched off and so the person lives a longer healthier life and do you think there's a difference between men and women in terms of their approach to being proactive about it? Or classically, I suppose men are probably seen to be reluctant to go to the GP, to be reluctant to go and get stuff checked. They're just not particularly good at it. Yes, I would agree with that. I think that men are a bit more nihilistic, a bit more cavalier. Um, men are actually, I, I see many patients who are sort of quote unquote dragged in by their wife uh, to be checked out uh, because something has happened to to one of the neighbours. The neighbours had a heart attack and then suddenly... Um, someone of the same age. The age is, is an interesting thing and in that patients will often look at their parents and say, well, my dad had a heart attack when he was 55. I'm 54. It's time to get it checked. And there's, a, there's an element of that. People look over their shoulder. Some men are very aware of the problem if they've had a very bad family history. Um, but I think the girls are better than the guys overall at, at getting, getting checked out. They're a little bit more attention to detail. Okay. And I suppose... The awareness of what screenings are available is probably an issue as well in terms of people don't really know what they can get done or the, the, the way the screenings kind of work. There's a lack of knowledge probably around it too. Yeah, I think you're. I think that's very true. I, I think if someone said they were going to their GP for a checkup, they'd kind of understand what that is. But perhaps the word screening opens a Pandora's box in their mind about they're going to have the bacon slicer or they're going to get a biopsy or they're going to have something really invasive done. Screening really is low tech, low cost, widely available and very effective at detecting these disorders that don't have symptoms like high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes um, and other. And, and, and we should should not forget cancer 
you know, cancer is the second biggest killer in Ireland. Cancer tends to run in families. Certain families will have a notorious track record with colon cancer or other cancers. And the cancers that we can screen for are the ones that can be cured if detected. Many cancers have, have a poor prognosis um, and therefore screening programs haven't been put in place to detect those cancers. But the classic big three in Ireland would be colon cancer with, with colon screening, with fecal occult blood testing. Um, and polyp detection, Through cervical cancer, we all know about that. That's been very prominent in the media. And then breast check has been a fantastic program uh, directed at mammography and identifying breast cancer early. They're the big three. The skin cancers are something that patients can deal with themselves by just looking at their skin and not blowing it off. If they have a mole on their skin that's changing in size or shape or color, if it's getting darker or lighter or bleeding or itchy, that's a red flag to go and have that taken off and, and subjected to a microscopic examination. And that could lead to an early diagnosis of skin cancer or melanoma and potentially save someone's life. And um, pa patients often do blow off skin cancers. They just put a bit of cream on it and move on to the next the next job on the list. And I, hands up, I am one of those people. I'm going to get my mole checked. I have one mole that I really wasn't happy with. And I'm very luckily married to a wonderful GP from Cork uh, who uh, nudged me in the right direction to go and get it sorted. I got onto my GP last week. I'm going for a consultation next week to a dermatologist to look at it properly because it doesn't look, just looks a bit dodgy. So it is important to look at your skin, to know your body, to know those moles and to constantly, you know, check them out and be aware of them. Definitely. And not to blow it off. I mean, a lot of people detect things um, and because there's not a lot of symptoms, it's not really causing them excruciating pain, they will blow it off. We're all very busy, people are running around, and I suppose in the last couple of years, general practices, as you know, and probably talking to your wife, the GP surgery is heaving with patients, um, vaccinations, uh, swabs for, for, for SARS-CoV-2, and the GPs have been on the back foot, and a lot of patients, and I've heard from a lot of GPs and hospital consultants that people are turning up now with for example, a breast lump that's been there for six months, maybe it had been dealt with in six weeks before, and patients have been have been afraid of this virus. They've been staying at home, not turning up to regular checks, and I think that highlights the importance of getting everyone back into the the proper level of of healthcare delivery. Again, we have to live with COVID nineteen as a disease, but we have to deal with all the other diseases which, in the past, in the present, and the future, will kill far more of us than this virus. And I suppose before we get on to the, the top six kind of health checks and chat through them, chat to us about, I suppose, from the front line in many respects, the impact that COVID is having on not just the hospital system, but also the screening process and trying to get into in for checks. What kind of impact is it having? Well, because screening has been sort of largely viewed as an elective procedure as it is, during the, 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 the peaks of the pandemic, a lot of screening programs were put into suspended animation and that was appropriate because screening often will involve a company or a club or a rugby club coming in and having, you know, 20 people checked or in an afternoon. Uh, Leia have a program, the Heartbeat program um, that we can talk about later on. And th th that would be an elective type of experience. In the peak of the pandemic, I think it was firefighting type medicine. Hospitals were full, clinics were full, GPs were busy. So screening got put on the back foot. And I've no doubt that that incubation will will bring disease out in the future. The Irish Cancer Society haven't crunched their statistics yet on that sort of delayed diagnosis and delayed um, intervention for cancers, but we're going to see a signal there. And in fact, I heard something on the radio about that this morning. So I think that, is, that, that has certainly damaged the, the momentum of screening. Um, and I think that has to be, that has to be re reinstated in parallel with the firefighting side of medicine. Um, there's no doubt that the hospitals have been, their diagnostics have been deflected in a different direction as well. And there's been a great fear um, during the early phases of the lockdown when we saw the terrible pictures coming in from Bergamo. Uh, people stayed at home. Regardless, I mean, I've seen patients staying at home with a heart attack, which is not a subtle, uh, subtle event. And coming in then with severe damage to their heart, which could have been easily fixed with the balloon angioplasty and a stent. Wow. Okay. So it, it's been, you know, it's been a phenomenal time for the health system. Absolutely. And there are six key things that we're going to have a look at. The first one is BMI in terms of the health checks that can really impact your health and help be preventative in the long term. Yeah. BMI, I think is, is near the top of the list because people probably don't realize this, but your body mass index, or if you're overweight, um, you can put whatever label you want on it. People have a good sense if they're overweight. If you're overweight, it it sets it sets the stage for the development of nearly every other disease that I'm aware of. It's a, people don't realize that being overweight is a big risk factor for cancer, for example, colon cancer being an example. But it's a big risk factor for 
all the orthopedic disease, dis disorders that we see in the lower limb, hip replacement, knee replacement. It's a precursor for diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, s disordered sleep uh, breathing, depression, poor performance uh, during the day from being being tired. So, so overweight, elevated BMI, obesity is right in the center of the Venn diagram. And as a society, we've got much heavier in the last 20 or 30 years. If you look at old photographs, Irish people were much thinner. Our diet is definitely wrong. Uh, exercise has been reduced. And, there, uh, and it's not entirely fair to, to throw that at every patient because there's complex hormonal pathways that regulate body weight that we shouldn't... Um, we shouldn't minimize their significance, but you know, high carbohydrate diet, sedentary occupation, working from home, all of that is a is an absolute fueling of of the problem. And this is our figures here are mirroring figures in North America, where the CDC have published, you know, state by state weight statistics for the American population, which have been grappling with a huge obesity epidemic for the last uh, two decades. Can I get your take on, on, on the societal component of, of BMI and of weight and, of, and being overweight? Like we're kind of moving into an area now of how we talk about weight. There's a very PC world around even mentioning weight in some regards and, and mentioning overweight. You know, you know, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think we're, we're very, very careful. Uh, um, I, I think, you know, no one should ever leave the office feeling worse than when they arrived. And if you tell them that they're, you know, massively overweight, they kind of know that already. So I think sometimes taking a tangential approach to it and suggesting maybe that they lose five kilograms next year and five kilograms the following year is a better way of coming at the issue of being overweight because it's an easy label to throw around. And I actually think as well that probably all of us are, our brain, the way we process the size of someone else is probably being, is probably morphing. And we're probably not even recognizing it until someone gets up on the weighing scales and does the calculation. Um, very heavy people are obvious, but I think you can see teenagers now who are overweight and they probably don't think they're overweight because their peers are of a similar body morphology to themselves. And I think that's happening. Uh, I, I see a lot of teenage girls in, in Cork with certainly a BMI that I would classify as overweight. And the statistics nationally are not good. Um, so I think, um, I think that's that's a problem. Weight on society that one stone overweight that we may have seen in the fifties and sixties and noticed has become normal to be one stone overweight that and we we normalize it as a society when we look you know when, when we do that it's just it's a it's a fascinating area and an area for an absolutely another podcast like I could do several podcasts around it because I'm I'm really interested in it yeah but to hear from yourself that it's you know it's your number one precursor for pretty much everything that if you are overweight and the more weight that you're carrying generally the higher the risk factor absolutely it's 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 center stage on, on, on an awful lot of what we see and um if you talk to the oncologists and talk to any specialist i mean even fatty liver disease is is a, is a factor it's not all alcohol um alcohol is a big problem but fatty liver disease diabetes you name it there's a there's a component there and the fact that it's a risk factor for cancer is not something that would be completely intuitive um, people think of cancer as the skinny guy who's wasting away, but I think you know if you look at the statistics, they're 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 glaringly obvious. Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. We're having a fascinating chat all around health checks, and um, we just touched on the first one there. We're going to go to the second one, which is blood pressure. A very simple check to get done, and it is really important to get your blood pressure checked. Absolutely, um, blood pressure is measured by putting a cuff on your arm, as you know, and you press a button and you get a number. Um, the higher your blood pressure, uh, the more at risk you are of stroke, heart disease and heart failure. And the prevalence of hypertension in Ireland is very, very high. Um, there are various stages of hypertension uh, as well. Um, and a lot of patients will have blood pressure elevations detected by their GP when they go in for some other reason and the GP measures their blood pressure. But screening for blood pressure is very easily done. Patients can buy a cuff and do it themselves and take some readings and, and see where, where their numbers are. Uh, we're encouraging people to, patients to measure their own blood pressure who have an established diagnosis because blood pressure checks at home with the patient over time will provide a very accurate picture of the profile of, of their hypertension disorder over the years. Um, there are monitors then to weed out patients who may have just a spike in blood pressure when they come into the doctor's office, some of those patients don't actually have hypertension, but they get a situational spike. And um, it's a significant uh, factor in, in cardiac patients. Uh, a lot of the patients I see have substantial hypertension and end up on two, three, four or five drugs 
because they've had it for so long that it's much harder to control now. Okay. Third one up, diabetes. Again, presumably it's f- becoming increasingly prevalent and, and an age profile is changing. Obviously, there's a type 1 and a type 2, and it's important to differentiate between the two of those, but it is something that's growing in terms of being a problem. Absolutely. Diabetes is, is another epidemic, and um, I think it's we're really when we're talking about the epidemic of diabetes, we're really talking about type 2 maturity diabetes, and that's the type of diabetes where your pancreas produces plenty of insulin, but your body isn't able to use that insulin to control metabolism. Uh, type 1 diabetes is where the pancreas fails, and that's often seen in a teenager, and that's a different condition completely. Uh, there really are very separate diseases. And type 2 diabetes tracks with elevated triglycerides, which are another uh, particle in the bloodstream, low levels of the protective cholesterol, HDL, um, hypertension, uh, increased waist circumference and being overweight, and a, and a, and a whole um, Pandora's box of other complications, including blindness, retinal failure, kidney failure, accelerated coronary artery disease, and stroke. So it, it's, it's a dreadful condition. It, is, it can be managed very well by weight loss and drugs, and um, sometimes bariatric surgery actually will, will offset the, some of the cascades that have been set up by a, in a type 2 diabetic. But it is an epidemic. It's growing and it's tracking with the elevated BMI epidemic that we talked about earlier. And how do you screen for diabetes then? So presumably it is a, it's a blood level check, I would imagine, is it? Yeah, it, it can be done with the blood glucose. Um, and there are ways of challenging the body's response to a glucose load. That's called a glucose tolerance test. And there's also a blood test called a HbA1c, and that's basically a measurement of how much sugar gets attached onto one of your red blood cells. So it's a way of looking back over the last 120 days, the lifetime of the red blood cell, to see how much sugar is coating it. If there's a lot of sugars attached to the red blood cell, one can make the inference that this person's had poor glucose control in the preceding couple of months. So there's a number of ways of attacking it, and it's relatively straightforward diagnosis. And if there's debate or if it's dubious, an endocrinologist can get involved to help to, uh, you know, sort out the the diagnosis, whether it's real or not. Okay, next up, cholesterol and lipid panel. Most people will have heard of cholesterol. Uh, Hopefully they've gone and got got there is checked. But tell us why it's important. Well, I think, again, a bit like blood pressure, cholesterol is a silent problem. Um, Some people will be aware of it because they'll say, well, my mum or dad had a very high cholesterol and they had a bypass in 1990 or something like that. That's a common story. But when you do, when you when you approach a large organization, we'll say a company or a club, and you screen a, a group of people that are joined together for some other reason, you will find within that pop within that population of people, a couple of people who will pop out with very high cholesterols. See it every day of the week. They are people that wouldn't have had their cholesterol measured because they've never had cause to go to their GP. So it's not their GP's fault. It's not their fault. It just pops up. And, and it's, you know, we can see a cholesterol of 10. I mean, the population cholesterol levels would average around the five mark in total. And then when, when you get back a very high cholesterol, you have, to, you have to delve into it a little bit more and look at the ratio of the so-called good cholesterol, the HDL to the bad LDL. But high levels of LDL cholesterol are what form the plaques in the coronary arteries and in the arteries in the head and neck. And that, that's a dangerous molecule. And we have powerful therapies now to lower LDL if it's deemed to be too high for the patient's long-term well-being. Okay. Colonoscopy, number five. Colonoscopy, I think, is very important. But again, I don't think everyone needs to go for a colonoscopy. This is where the family history comes in. And knowing your family history is really important. Um, If there's a family history of colon cancer in a first degree relative at a relatively young age, and I'm not talking about someone who's 80 or 90, but we'll say someone has colon cancer at the age of 55, their first degree relatives should get checked. Because colon cancer begins as a polyp, which is a little little uh, mushroom-like growth in the colon and that polyp can be identified and it can be pulled out before it becomes malignant and invades. So colonoscopy is a very useful test if there's a family history. Um, In some countries people will be offered a sigmoidoscopy which is kind of half a colonoscopy over a certain age to screen for colorectal cancer but it's a very it's, it's a good screening uh, test done in the appropriate population because you can prevent the disease happening that's beginning to happen. Um, it's completely different to, to something like pancreas cancer, where it's going to be very difficult to manage it and, and get it under control at any stage that you detect it. But colon cancer is, 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 is good value for money, I think. And I think if there's a bad family history, you get your colonoscopy done at a certain age, discuss it with your family doctor and get a referral on 
Um, many people leave that go too late. And if there's any change in bowel habit or symptoms of bleeding or constipation or diarrhea or a change in, in bowel habit, people should seek medical attention straight away and get a, get a colonoscopy. Fantastic advice. Okay, number six is what my own uh, my own latest one, skin check. So skin check is important because, again, it's it's basically free. If you see something on your skin that you're worried about, as you mentioned in, in your introduction, Carl, you get it sorted. But I have seen patients leave this go. Um, a farmer has something itchy on his ear. He puts a bit of steroid cream on it, gets back to the farm and finds out that he has a basal cell carcinoma of his ear. Um, and then he has to have his ear taken off um, the whole ear, not just a little bit of the ear. People get freckles. They ignore them. They think it's just a, a mole and moles are dangerous. The, the interpretation of these is very specialized um, skill. Uh, you know, people have mole clinics, they've got pigmented mole clinics now in most of the large city hospitals where you can go in and have your pigmented mole checked out by expert dermatologists who are very experienced at eyeballing these and if necessary taking them off and, and subjecting them to pathological examination that's really important that you don't blow that off melanoma particularly is a disaster if it gets if it, if it becomes widespread okay and were you surprised by the results from the research findings that when they came in well i'm not hugely surprised in that I think we all see the other end of the uh, of the iceberg here. Uh, we see the tip of the iceberg in the hospital where people come in with disease. But for that disease to present, you, 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 there are probably many more people who haven't shown up because the hospital isn't going to have all the patients coming in with a particular problem. So you have to assume there's a lot more disease incubating out there. And I think the survey has shown that people are reluctant to come forward. I, I think for all the reasons we mentioned earlier, um, Screening can be done by yourself to some extent, certain conditions such as skin and blood pressure. Screening can be done by your family doctor, it can be done by a clinic. And then these sophisticated screening programs that incorporate a family history, a symptom check, a mental health check, an ECG and bloods to address diabetes, high cholesterol and things like that. They're very comprehensive because they tick a lot of boxes in one sitting and they can be applied to large groups of people relatively quickly and relatively cheaply. Professor Carl Vaughan, thank you so much for the fascinating content on today's episode. Folks, everything we've discussed today is based on recent research by Leia Healthcare. You can find out more details at www.leahhealthcare.ie forward slash health screening. And there's a live event with Professor Carl Vaughan at 2 p.m. on Thursday the 2nd. And you can register on the very same link, which is www.leahhealthcare.ie forward slash health screening. That's it for another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Light Healthcare. As ever, you know where we are, at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram, and realhealth at independent.ie. As ever, we'll see you next week for more Real Health. Slán go Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.